Gabe brings a unique insight to the community as he has experienced life identifying as a lesbian, transgender male, and now pansexual male. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science from Texas A&M University in 2014, where he was an activist for the community on campus and mentored incoming transgender students. Gabriel, after he graduated, uh, moved back to Dallas and joined a local trans men group to continue his advocacy through providing medical, legal, and social resources for those in the area. His career has led him to McKesson in 2017, where he is the co-chair for the LGBTQ Employee Resource Group. Outside of work, Gabriel is an avid, avid outdoorsman and craftsman, and his hobbies include building log homes, woodworking, camping, hiking, and overlanding. His goal is to one day create an inclusive campground where members of the community can, feel, uh, can come and feel safe exploring the outdoors. Gabriel, everyone. Oh, Thank you. And last but not least, Thomas Massaqua, who is our moderator uh, for all of our panels and the co-creator for Humanity 101. Uh, Thomas is an author, acclaimed visual artist, and filmmaker. He comes with over two decades of experience of advocacy towards inclusivity, tolerance, education, and continued self-growth. I would just like to thank Thomas for all of the hard work he has put in over this last uh, what, 22 months that we've, mm. we've put work into this and had panels. Um, and I would also like to thank Brandy, who did an awesome article uh, for us in the Dallas Voice. Those of you who may not have seen it, please feel free to go to their website and take a look at the article. Um, it really talks about, uh, it's, kind of, it's the embodiment of what Humanity 101 is, and it talks about how we got started and the work that we have put into it thus far. Um, Justin, actually, his company provided the water for the panelists, so thank you, Justin, for that. And one last thank you to you all in the audience. We really appreciate you being here. We the weather and the traffic and all of that fun stuff has um, kept some of our audience members away for the evening. Uh, but we are thrilled at the turnouts that we've had over the last year, and we're ecstatic to see what next year holds. So for everyone who has been here and has signed up, you should see some things on our Instagram and Facebook. Feel free to follow us, um, and then probably email as well, and we'll keep you all updated with what's happening next. So without further ado, I will let Thomas take it over, and um, we will have our panel. Thank you, Gage. So welcome to Humanity 101, guys. Um, I know some of you have sat in as guests, and this is your first time coming into our world of discussion. Um, so we're just going to start off, and you can kind of jump in, jump out, and respond how you want to. But we'd like to know first, discussing your origins, like your beginnings, like what were you like growing up? Um, what was your path to finding your true self and your own individuality and sort of in many ways being honest with yourself? Feel free to start off with anyone. Anyone? I, yeah, I okay. guess I can start. Okay. Um, so I grew up in a very conservative small town, mm -hmm. um, the most conservative county in the 2004 and 2008 presidential election cycle so about as far right as you go so in texas in texas okay yes in texas um i think we had like four registered democrats in the whole county wow. so it was yeah it was pretty um pretty conservative mm -hmm. so i feel like i'm the same person um i try to be the same person you know just to reaffirm the fact that after you come out, you know, you are that same person. Nothing's really changed about you mm -hmm. except for, you know, some people know some more information about you. But, yeah, I grew up, like, hunting, fishing, playing sports, you know, mm -hmm. all that stuff. And it was not super difficult because I obviously wasn't out at the time. But it was difficult to see other people who maybe couldn't hide their sexuality mm -hmm. kind of grow up in the same environment and not really be able to to help or, you know in any way stand up for them because you were afraid for yourself as well. Mm -hmm. um, but went to college, which was a great experience, um, Texas Tech, and super, super LGBT, LGBT friendly. Mm -hmm. And it took, I went to study abroad for a little while, and that's kind of where I found myself. So that's kind of my coming out origin story. Where'd you go? Um, Spain. España. Yeah, okay. which okay. the very first day I actually saw like two 15-year-olds holding hands like as I got off the train. I was like, ah, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so it was great, yeah. Okay. 
Um, I grew up in Corpus Christi, which is like the southern tip. Okay, gente, you you know you know it's the southern tip of Texas. It's very um, a very brown community, and you know it's it's pretty close to the border and. And in our culture, we don't necessarily talk about queerness. We don't talk about the LGBT community. But I knew from a very young age that I was a lesbian um, or that I was gay. And I came out to myself when I was 16. Um, I had my first kiss with a girl. And she actually ended up living in our house when I was growing up. But my parents didn't know that I was a lesbian. Um, I'm an only child. And my parents, my dad is a psychotherapist, so my dad was the first generation to go to college. He's the first one to get a bachelor's, the first one to do anything. Um, and so that was, that was different for our family. And so I come from a, that um, diff a different kind of mentality. All that to say that it's harder for me now as a 42-year-old out lesbian than it was back then because my parents have just become born again. My dad is a minister in the evangelist faith, like so he's like the brown Joel Olstein, basically. Um, and so it's it's been an interesting transition for me because I grew up very loved and open and my dad was the one that taught me about feminism. He taught me about how, you know, why would we as, you know, gays choose to be gay? Like we're born this way. Like why would anybody choose this kind of hard lifestyle? And then to see that switch now as he's gotten older and I've gotten older to where now when I asked for his hand and his blessing to marry my wife, he said no because of his faith. And so it's been interesting because I feel like I've gone backwards mm -hmm. um, with my family. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, I think my origins just keep and, and, and I keep growing more and more with, with each passing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Makes sense. We'll talk about that more a little okay. bit later. Uh, okay. Thanks, Thomas. So... Just like you guys, um, you know, whenever I came out as a lesbian back when I was like 17 mm -hmm. in high school, I mean, at that time, you know, I was a little butch mm -hmm. and um, my mom was actually the one who, who asked me if I was a lesbian. Mm -hmm. She's like, oh, do you like girls? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, no big deal. And she's like, oh, OK, just wondering. And then that was that. Like my parents are very accepting people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after I came out to them, I didn't even know what transgender was mm -hmm. you know at the time even though i did grow up here locally i still just the information wasn't really out there for mm -hmm. us like we didn't have a gay straight alliance at school no resources mm -hmm. at that time mm -hmm. and it wasn't until i went to college that i learned about you know what being transgender was at the time i thought i was gender queer because um, i was still like coming into terms with my identity and i was like well maybe i don't i was like being transgender is too expensive like, I can't afford the hormones. I can't afford the surgeries. Like, this, I just can't do it. So I'm going to come out as genderqueer and, like, you know, so I can still be masculine but still look feminine, you know, like, mm -hmm. just trying to trying to figure out my identity at the time. And then it, it was actually pretty funny. My sister was the first one to say, are you transgender? And uh, I, was, I was like, you know what? Yeah, I am. And she was like, you know... And she was the first person in my family to know, like, first outside anybody. And she's like, you know, I'd love you if you were an alien, you know, and, like, gave me a hug. And um, she was the first person I talked to about what name I wanted to go with, mm -hmm. you know. And so since then, like, even coming out to my parents as trans transgender, they're like, do you – at a young age, I was, I was 18, 19. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it wasn't too long after my lesbian experience I was like – even hanging around with like butch lesbians, they still felt like women. And I was like, I don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know, like I don't want to wear a dress period. You know, I don't want to talk about anything related to like, you know, being a female. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so then whenever I came out to my parents at such a, a young age during that time, they asked me like, do you have enough life experience to even make that decision for yourself? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was like, you know, what? I, I do because even when I was younger, um, you know, when you dream, every time I would dream, I was a boy in my dreams, you know? And then it wasn't even, I was like six years old when I first felt different than the other guys because I would always hang out with the boys. 
and we were all at a pool, and we were all swimming, and I was w- swimming in my soccer shorts, and um, they were, like, laughing. They're like, oh, yeah, like, you were flashing us the other day. So we're all, like, kids. And I was like, what does that even mean? You know, like, nobody else is wearing a shirt. Like, I'm not wearing a shirt. Mm-hmm. And then that was, like, the time when my parents were like, it's probably time for you to start wearing a shirt, like, when you go swimming. And I was like, that just doesn't make sense. And uh, so you, you know it when you're younger. You just don't know. You don't know what that is, mm-hmm. you know. And so they're like, oh, and then they're like, oh, you're just a tomboy. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. And so then living as that until so finally getting the definition, the resources around, I'm like, man, this is – it's been right there my whole life, you know. And so once I assured my parents that my health was going to be okay, my social life was going to be okay, I mean their biggest concern were, was are people going to treat you different? Are they going to treat you wrong? Are you going to be able to find a life partner? You know, so those were the, like in your health, right? Mm-hmm. So once I reassured them that I was going to be okay, you know, then they were like, out, out of everything that we say tonight, the thing, the message that we want to get across to you is that we love you and we accept you, no matter who you are. That's awesome. So a lot of you guys talked about, you know, your coming out and um, we, where you kind of felt it was already within you. Along your journey, what do you think, if, with, with what you're comfortable sharing, what was your lowest moment in your journey of finding your truth? Anyone want to share? My 20s. <laughs> your 20s? That was your lowest moment? <laughs> like my entire 20s. Okay. Um, I, think, I think for me, the lowest, I, I think it was my 20s, but I think that was because I don't represent and I don't read as lesbian or queer. I read very straight. Um, I can be sitting across, you know, my wife, who's a manager at JR's and having a drink and still get hit on by straight men that come in there. It's, mm. it's, so I don't read as queer. And so my queerness has always had to come from within. And I think in my 20s, I was still battling that in a sense that I was like, well, because I don't look like, and I don't want to be butch. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to cut my nails. Like I like glitter. I like, I love rhinestones. Like Mm -hmm. I'm more of a drag queen than a lesbian. And so (laughs) I really am. Um, And so like, I think my 20s was where I was trying to navigate that space between I, I don't I I don't look this way, so then I can't be that way, even though my insides were saying you are. And so, you know, there was lots of, you know, drugs and, and running away and drinking. And I think everything that we do when we're trying when we're avoiding ourselves mm-hmm. um, and we're just hoping to kind of negate it away. But I think without that journey, I don't think that I would be as strong of, you know, in in my roots as I am today. So, my twenties. Gotcha. <laughs> um, probably, probably seventeen, eighteen was really tough for me, um, purely for the fact that. And to preface this, my parents and I have a great relationship now, so it's fine. But uh, my parents were getting divorced, as a lot of people's parents were getting divorced, and so like that's a tough time for a teenager, I guess. But um, my father turned to me and said after they. My parents basically sat us down and was like, hey, we're not, you know, going to be married anymore or whatever, and said, you know, this is your fault, Justin. If you had been better, we wouldn't have anything to fight about. So that was rough because I have an identical twin, and he were identical. Like, he's great at a lot of things. I feel like I'm good at a lot of things, but he focused on a lot of the masculine qualities a little bit more. So I was a little more studious and he was a little more athletic. And so it was more, you know, from, I guess my dad's standpoint of, you know, why can't you be team captain rather than just on the team? Why can't you, you know, prioritize working out more like miles? Why can't you date women like miles is dating women? Um, And so that was tough, you know, and I think it really affected me for, several years and I think I've obviously you know worked my way through it but it really to me was a huge lesson on you know happiness comes from within you can't let a partner a parent anybody um, really dictate how you feel about yourself and obviously it wasn't my fault you know Um, but I think that was that was a really dark not great time but 
Um, it really made me kind of pull myself up by the bootstraps and be confident and happy with who I am, with my capabilities, and like, no, like, I know that these are my two feet that I can stand on, and really just have that confidence, which, which I think is huge and a lot of people are lacking nowadays. So, yeah, that was a, kind of a rough one, but glad to go through it, you know. I feel like it has made me the person I am today, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk about, like, two instances in my life, but I think they're very important because during these moments, it kind of made a decision of who am I going to be? Am I going to be someone that somebody walks all over, or am I going to stand up for myself and in my identity? And I'll start with the first one where it was about three months into my medical transition. So very fragile in my identity still. Um, and I was going to the pharmacy to fill my hormone prescription. And the pharmacist looked me in the eye and said, I'm not filling this prescription and you know why. And I was like, no, I don't know why actually. So enlighten me. And he's like, this is morally wrong what you're doing and I'm not filling this prescription. And I was like, oh, okay. And so it wasn't just the fact that he, we were face to face and he was telling me this. He actually called the number that was listed on my profile, which is my parents' home. And I was away in college at the time. Calling my parents' house, leaving multiple voicemails saying like, this is wrong, going to hell, like all of these things that my parents were calling me like, what is going on up there? And I was like, oh no, I got this handled. And uh, so I went to the proper channels, filed an official um, complaint with them. And this moment, it wasn't like, I wasn't necessarily doing this just for myself. Like everything that we do is for the people after you to make sure that they don't have it as bad as we do. And so when I, when I stood up there and I talked to him and I talked to their manager and I filed a complaint with you know their company – and they called me the next day. They're like, the head pharmacist called me and said, you are not the first person that he has done this to. This was his last straw, and he's fired. Period. And it, just imagine if, if there were people before me that this happened to, and they didn't say anything, you know? And so maybe it wouldn't have happened to me. But I know for damn sure it's not going to happen to the person behind me mm. because I'm not standing for this. Mm. And um, the next time, I was still in college. So... You know, because and during college is like you know a very, very different time because you're you're having to come out all the time to people, um, and so I was rowing on. I, I rowed crew during college. You know, it's like you know on the little boats and yeah. seat slides. That's me, and uh, so I rowed crew. And after I started transitioning, I told my coach, "Hey, um, just so you know, I I'm medically transitioning." You know, going by this, these are my pronouns, X, Y, Z. And he said, you know, the only team that you're eligible to row for now is men's varsity. So I was like, oh, great. Like, he seems really accepting. I'm rowing men's varsity now. So we're in preseason. It's been months I've been training with the men's team. And so we're about a week out from our first regatta, which is like our race. And first week, he calls me aside. He's like, hey, um, so what are you, what's your anatomy like now? And I was, like, really thrown off because, first off, I'm a student. This is, like, a very inappropriate conversation to have with anybody, period. But, like, I'm a student and you're a coach. And uh, so I was, like, this is not your business, first off. And so I take that information. I go talk to my close friends at the dean's office with the head of diversity, head of sports and athletics, and the dean himself, and told him what happened. And guess what? He's gone. So, like, I'm not – and they asked me, you can row men's varsity. Do you want to row? And I told them, it's not about me. It's about the, the kids that come here after me who want to row on this team. I don't want them to face somebody like that. I want them to be eligible to row. Like, I don't, I don't care about myself. It's about the other people, always. And uh, they're like, okay, well, done. They can row, no problem. He's gone. So he, they fired him. So I think those are these are moments in our lives where we have to step up for ourselves. Like you can turn your lowest point, your anger, into positive passion, and then just advocate, advocate, do what you can to make sure that people after you are okay. So, segueing into that, what is your personal greatest moments in 
finding yourselves? Um, or what would you say, are you still seeking that, that top of your mountain or have you had that moment yet of where you're like, in my truth, like I've, I've been able to see the top of my mountain and it looks beautiful. Have any of you guys experienced any of that yet? Or are you guys still in, on that path? I, I think I have in the sense that, you know, I mentioned earlier how I never really identified in, in the traditional stereotypical sense of a lesbian. I think I found that the moment that I realized that my biological gender did not impact how I chose to express my queerness. And so... In 2005, I've always been, I've always wanted to be a drag queen. Like I grew up, I was like, Miss Piggy was my idol, Lisa Frank, <laughs> like I was just a drag divine, like everything. Like, I mean, I wanted to be a drag queen. And I remember, you know, I was, when I was 16 and I was coming out, I went to my first drag show and Erin Davis, the queen in Corpus Christi who owned this amazing club called UBU, um, she took me under her wing and she was the first drag queen that let me go behind the curtain and see the transition. And I was like, this is me, this is who I am. And I, for, and that was maybe part of the 20s, not figuring out, I was still like, I'm a drag queen, I'm a drag queen, and not re really understanding where I fit in, in this whole LGBTQ queer spectrum. And I think the highlight for me was in my late 30s, or in my early 30s, figuring out that, Drag or any kind of expression is not about drag is not about gender. It is about queer expression. It's about it's about how we as queer people express ourselves. It doesn't have to do with switching bio, bio gender. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do about expression. And I think for me, owning and stepping foot, my first pageant that I ever did was 2012 here in Dallas. It was the Miss Life Walk pageant, um, and I came in first runner up, but just stepping foot on that stage in my pure queerness and having people look at me in the sense of not as a gender, but just as a queer performer and having people being so engulfed in the performance itself, I think that has always been like the epitome for me. Like being able to make people see past my gender on stage and just see the art and performance, like that is always my highlight. Like where people don't go, is that a boy or a girl? Is that, you know, it's just like art, mm -hmm. you know, period. So, yeah. I love the idea of highlights in a life, mm -hmm. I think you definitely get some. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I started my own business. To me, like that's a highlight. You know, um, I've been like active in the charity scene and like help. You know, my family as a group. We, I think a few years ago we raised about raised or donated about twenty thousand dollars in one year. This year it's going to be almost three million dollars, which is incredible highlight. Mm -hmm. But I think that the highlights that matter most to me aren't like the big moments in life that everybody kind of sees. It's the fact that, hey, I'm on a board of a charity and someone I knew from my conservative hometown clearly knows that this is a gay organization and donates it to it, donates to it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. That's a huge highlight for me. Mm -hmm. Because you just say like, these people, I mean, according to like a lot of people from my hometown, I'm the first gay person they've ever met. You know, like <laughs> jokes on you guys, but mm -hmm. but to me, those highlights changing hearts and minds through your actions and and just proving like, hey, I'm still the same person you knew. We're still out here to help and and better the world and getting them to come around in in the long way mm -hmm. versus maybe well, not. There's definitely a place for like protest and like screaming from the mountaintops, but I think that those are the highlights that really matter to me is is just changing people's attitudes and things like that um, on the, the small things because they add up so yeah yeah I think I think that's a good call out too because I wouldn't say I had a necessarily a big moment um, I think it's just from pure visibility on my end um, the messages I get from people who are questioning or they're just coming out and they message me like oh my gosh like thank you for being visible can you help me with this resource or you know, I've been wanting to tell my parents, you know, can you help me? And my parents even did like a how to come out to your parents trans 101, like YouTube video with me, you know? And, um, and so just the people who message me all the time that are young or maybe they're old, you know, like I talked, I, I showed someone 
you know, a just a new trans guy in his 40s just coming out, how to tie a tie, you know? Like, that was a big deal for him to, like, go to a, another interview. And I think it's just those little things of, like, helping people, and they just ne- have never even seen that resource before. You know, you'd be surprised how many how many times I'm, like, the first transgender people, transgender person that anybody's ever met. Hmm. You know, maybe someone in here, is, I'm your first one. You're welcome. <laughs> but... <laughs> So that being said, um, let's talk about subgroups, your individual subgroups. What are uh, maybe two or three myths you'd like people, the other groups to, you like to debunk myths that you normally hear people say, oh, well, your tribe is like this or your group is like this. And you're like, that's far from the truth. Anybody want to open that? Yeah, I guess I'll go. Because my community, we have like a million myths, Uh you know, like there's just so much misinformation out there about transgender people in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm just going to, I'll just touch on a few. Um, This concept between transitioned and transitioning. Like there's no end to a transition. It's not past tense. Um, Whenever you start medically transitioning, you have to take it the rest of your life. You know, and so it, you can choose not to, but you know, you're supposed to be on your hormones the rest of your life once you take it. And, um, so that, like, you're, you're constantly changing as a person. You never truly end. And uh, so that, that piece and then, you know, this concept between, oh, well, when did you have the surgery? Like, what does that even mean? You know, because there are so many people in the community that choose not to have surgery. They choose not to go on hormones. Like, that is totally acceptable. Not everybody is the same way. And, um, you know, just to say the surgery... We're not all doing it. But isn't that kind of rude? It's I've so heard, rude. That, that's like, I've, it's really I've, rude. Yeah, I've heard in many contexts that's like the one question that. That is one is like, don't ask like my yeah. dead name. That's yeah, like, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a big one. Okay. Um, I'll say it, but like, you know, if, if I know that it, it's not malicious, like, yeah, I'll yeah. talk to you about it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a big one. And then just the separation between gender identity and sexual orientation. That's a big one. You know, one too, let's yeah. just start baseline. Um, you know, your gender identity is in your mind, your sexual orientation is in your heart. Yeah. You know, that's a good way to separate it. And so when you're asking people what part of the community are, you're like, well, I'm transgender, but it's not really the same. You know, like I'm not coming out to my, my parents as I'm liking someone who's similar to me. I'm telling them I'm about to change your whole world. Like I'm not even your daughter anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I'm your son. You don't have to tell your friends, oh, I had two dollars, two daughters and a son. Now I have two sons and a daughter, Mm -hmm. you know, how starting that conversation with them, it's, it's hard, Yeah, you know? So those are some things. Yeah. Cause we spoke with Matthew, Dr. Matthew Chester about mental health, um, our last lecture. And we were talking about the difference between all the other letters within the community of where the L, the G and the B deals with more sexual orientation. Whereas the T is dealing with more your identity of who you are. And when we're, you're, when you're, when we're focusing on like a lot of the issues that are coming up within the community, you know, it's it's a different um, purview for people that are within your group too as well because you're talking about this is me, this is my idea. I'm talking about me as a person, like an, yeah. uh, being being recognized as a human being. Whereas, you know, not saying that the other groups are discredited. It's just saying that a lot of the time, you know, they normally lump in the fact that being transgender. Is focused on your sexuality too right and i mean we're all fighting the good fight yeah you know and so we we get lumped in yeah with the community so often because we're we're facing a lot of the same adversities mm. and you know one thing that i'll call out on that as well is you know a lot of there's this myth that you know say you're a straight man and you date a trans woman that you're gay like that's not that's not true mm-hmm. you know like you're dating a woman mm-hmm. period mm-hmm. And uh, it doesn't matter what happened before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's how they identify. That's how, you know, he identifies as well. And you see so many cases where they're like, oh, you know, or, you know, me and my boyfriend. No one's coming up to him saying that he's straight. Do you think, like, I don't look like a girl? Mm-hmm. You know, like, I'm pretty sure no one would look at us and be like, oh, he's a straight man. And, you know, I'm, you know, we're both heterosexual. I mean, we're, heter- we're heterosexual, we're uh, not heterosexual, we're not heteronormative if we were, you know, say he was a girl, and we were dating, and, you know, I'm still a boy, so 
that's hetero, you know, sexual where he could be trans and, you know, I'm cisgender. Um, but then when she's throwing the fact that one of us is trans, then it's just heterosexual, you know, because we're still a boy and girl dating in this situation. Um, but just not heteronormative where there's two cisgender people dating. Yeah. So. Makes sense. And if you'd like to explain cis, because we did talk about it last time, but oh, some people aren't. Yeah. So, yeah. like, cisgender is just um, biologically male, biologically female. Thank yeah. you. Mr. Rogers? Uh, yeah. So, definitely a different viewpoint. Um in, in my mind on what I've been going through, like myth wise, I've been thinking about this question for a while. Number one, I don't think that we're all drama machines that travel in packs, <laughs> which, you know, is funny, but uh -huh. at the same time, like yeah. people so kind true. of, kind of believe that. Uh -huh. um, and I think it's important to dispel that because those people definitely exist, uh -huh. you know, in every category of every human experience. Yeah. Um, but like, I don't think that that's the vast majority of people's experience. You know, I moved to Dallas, not knowing anyone I joined diva, the Dallas intramural volleyball association, mm -hmm. great people. There's not a lot of drama, you know, I think that, and, you know, I think I'm seeing less and less of it, mm -hmm. but I still think a lot of maybe, um, straight people still like to categorize gay men, like in sexual roles, mm -hmm. you know, like talk about inappropriate questions. Um, a lot of the times you, you'll meet someone, it's really older people. I don't know why older people love to be like, oh, like, are you at the top or the bottom? Like, oh gosh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well you're like my parents' friend. This is weird. You know? <laughs> That's um, a question that they shouldn't be asking. Right. Yeah, that's also a no-fly zone for, <laughs> right. yes, okay. I but gotcha. for whatever reason, they feel like, you know, they're comfortable asking that. So I think it's just myth uh, myths about, you know, you don't have to be in, in one role. And it's, if you're categorizing any group in, you know, like two or three, four categories of mm -hmm. this, this, and this, mm -hmm. you're wrong probably about the majority of them. So mm -hmm. I think it's just about really showing people the, the full experience and diversity of, like, just the gay group. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I was, I'm trying to think, I, I, I think there's, I think one of the myths is that as a whole, and this is not, you know, just, um, exclusive to lesbians is it's a lot more complex than the single letter, than the singularity of a, the letter represents. And so, you know, the first thing when you asked that question that came to mind, you know, what are the myths? We don't all look like the L word. We're not all white. And not every woman that is in a gay bar is a straight fag hag, you know? Because I think that, again, you know, there's this conversation that's been ha happening in our community about women being in gay bars. Well, not all women who are in gay bars are fag hags or, you know, straight women. You know, a lot of them are lesbians. And so I think the, I think the biggest myths are are that there's a lot more complexity within this letter, that letter, that letter, and then us as a whole. But then also, there, it's much more diverse than I think mainstream media represents, or we've been represented as far as like lesbians, you know, the L word, I know that's coming back and it's a little bit more all inclusive. So it's queer as folk. Is, and is it really? Yeah, queer I don't folk know, queer as folk, I love, I love queer as folk more than I like the L word, which tells you a lot about how I identify. Um, <laughs> but I, I think those are the biggest myths for, for me as I see it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody else would say something completely different. And, and uh, yes, please understand that, you know, I do understand that there's n there's no pressure to feel like you have to answer for your entire tribe or group. Yeah, no, 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 no. We are missing our bees, but you know, we got love for them too. Um, the next question I would like to ask you guys, since we're on this topic, have you guys seen the Chappelle stand-up special? Yes. I have not. I've heard about I've, it. You've heard, heard about it. it. Yeah. Rockets okay. and boats. Okay, and you, um, there was a comment in reference, and this sort of was the idea behind the title of this lecture, last lecture was Alphabet Education, where he calls the group the alphabet people. They take up 25% of the alphabet. You know, he's like, you don't want to offend them, X, Y, and Z. And then he talks about the group in driving a car yeah. and the breakdown of what each letter is. And um, is there anyone that would like to either respond to that or anyone that would have a comment about that or have you, at all? Yeah, I mean, just off of what you said, because yeah. I have not seen it. Yeah. Um, 
you know, someone saying, hey, they're the alphabet people, they take up 24% of the alphabet, you don't want to offend them. To me, that's probably a compliment for our group. You don't want to offend the LGBT community because, you know, we are growing in economic power, we are growing in political power, and, you know, for someone to kind of make a joke of it, sure, but at the same time, it was said um, to a broad audience that probably doesn't, you know, realize where we're going, where we obviously where we are, but where we're headed in the future. Mm-hmm. I think it's great. I think it's any exposure is is good exposure, especially when it says like, "Hey, this is a group of people with that hold power, and we should, you know, walk lightly." Mm-hmm. Anybody else? I had a really long conversation with my wife. is black. I'm brown, and so we had a really long conversation um, because I had multiple reactions when I watched this. The first thing, you know, I, I think when you're seeing something like that, it depends on how you you um, rank your identities within yourself. You know, okay. are you queer first? Are you brown? Are you female? Like how how in yourself do you rank? How do you rank your identities? And for me, it's always been queer and it's been brown. And so for my wife, it's always been black and then brown. And so we had this really interesting conversation because I think had it come from a white comedian, I would have maybe felt a little bit differently. But because it came from Chappelle, who is black, he understood he understands what it's like to be a minority. He understands what it's like to be persecuted, which is why he should know better in a sense, because he's part of a marginalized group that is still facing, you know, persecution, you know, who are getting killed at, you know, rates by police. He should know better um, than that. And I think also his audience isn't very queer friendly to begin with, I don't think. And so I think bringing in that kind of humor to a place that doesn't necessarily know anything about the LGBT community is really detrimental and coming from this whole affront of, oh, well, you know, they're just gonna leave the tea behind. It's the same shit that we're having discussions with within ourselves, but coming from a straight man who is in power, and he mentioned. Did you hear about the transgender woman? Yes. And she, she, yeah, she, yes. she killed herself, herself like yes. after after it came the out. The one, the one that um, he originally fr- from the, the original. Yeah. Okay, so just because this is being recorded, so the preface is there was a there was a special that he did previously that he had referenced a transgender female, and then that person came up again in the second special, and that person has now passed on. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about. Okay, just wanted to make that clear. Okay, go on. So Anybody that's, else? yeah, I, I think, I think it's one, of, I think he's got a point. I think we are, as a community, this whole semantic thing is one of these things that I just can't, I, I it's too much. I think we're self-policing ourselves language-wise. So I get, I get the, I get that. Mm-hmm. But I think that, because of everything that we've been going through, it's just bad timing, maybe. But then again, I'm like, does he really feel like that? And then why is why would he present that, knowing full well what it's like to be marginalized in in um, America? Yeah. You know. Yeah, and you know, I'm glad I'm glad you brought up you know the suicide that did happen with with this woman, unfortunately, and. I think it just kind of highlights that, you know, you can pick fun at people, but like you're saying, tread lightly because our group is so marginalized. Like, yeah. LGBT is already marginalized. Then T, we're super marginalized, you know, yeah. especially being of color too, like mm-hmm. your intersectionality of how you fit into everything. Um, and I, I don't know so. if, I don't know if this woman was of color or not. She was white. Okay. And regardless, um, you know, I think that, with how society has just recently started to push more against the transgender community because we have been so much in the media, um, it's important not to add any more to the fire, any more fuel to the yeah. fire because we're already struggling just to live as we are without walking out on the street and then someone pulling over and shooting you, mm-hmm. you know, because they know you're trans. Mm-hmm. So visibility is, is rough for us, and we have a lot of us – Fortunately, unfortunately, like we have the power to what you call pass in society where people don't know you're trans. Mm-hmm. You know, they see you every day. Like I've had transphobic people tell me in my face, I would know someone who's trans if I saw them. I would know if a girl was peeing in the best the bathroom next to me. I'm like, dude, we've been in the bathroom a million times. You know, like you don't know. Mm-hmm. 
And um, so I th- I just think that you know we're we're already hurting. Yeah. So I just don't I just don't take the jokes lightly anymore. And then I wonder if because you know there was such pushback for his previous Netflix special that he did when he talked about I can't remember what he said but he said something about the LGBT uh, T plus community again, and I wonder how much he did it this time around for shock value as well. You know, I wonder if if what was the intent? I would love to sit down and ask him what his intention behind it was because was it shock value? Was it humor? What what was the intention behind it? So. But, you know, I also think that that is his job. He is a comedian, and obviously he stepped over the line this time. But I've seen him poke fun at every group. Yeah. So obviously this is a terrible situation that someone, you know, took their own life and things like that. But I think it also adds to the national dialogue on this and gives everybody like us on this stage an opportunity to speak out and educate other people about it. So there could be some good that comes out of it. I agree. It's a really complex issue because it's like it is humor. It's 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 an art form that we are now policing again with semantics like we're policing ourselves. So it's a really complex issue that I think we could spend the entire night talking about. So um, oh, yeah, we, I think we I think everybody <laughs> can go on and talk about it. So the narrative in 2019 we Um, have seen in headlines about different things that are happening to the community, where it would be bans on, you know, being part of the military, talking about repealing uh, certain rights. Um, Do you think, in terms of what we're talking about with the media, do you think that the LGBTQ community in general is leading the charge in trying to resolve their own issues? Do you think that... um, their allies are playing a big, uh, playing a big enough part. Another layer question is that: Do you think that the other letters are really in support of each other, or do you think they're kind of looking out for their own personal self-interest right now, on a mainstream level? So I think I'll I'll take that question. Okay. So for for as a narrative, um, you know, I think the people who create narratives are the ones that speak the loudest. Mm-hmm. And and my situation and my community situation. Unfortunately, those people that are speaking the loudest are the people who are uneducated Mm -hmm. about the transgender community. Um, So you're talking about myths earlier. I mean, those are the myths that are coming from their sexual predators because they want to go into the bathroom they identify with. Um, They're the ones saying that we have mental illness or disorders because, you know, we're we're not the same as what we were born as. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for to take on, you know, some of your other commission, like how. Are, are there allies supporting us? Like, yes, we're we're trying to actively, you know, rebuttal these myths that are coming out on the media, but nobody else is really covering the what's right, you know, like what's true, and uh, or they are, and it's just not it's not getting publicized as big as these other people are already writing about, and so it's so hard to go ahead and back what's right all the time when there's so many wrongs that are coming out. It's like we can't keep up. And then to add fuel to the fire, I mean, we're like, and unfortunately, a lot of, I hate to say it, gay men are very vicious towards the trans community, you know, like specifically trans women. Uh, they definitely, That's true. yeah, they have it the worst. Trans women do. And um, so I think, and it's, it's weird because it's always like butch lesbians and gay men are the ones that are really rough on our community. And then everybody else is usually has no problem. And I think it's really unfortunate because, you know, we're all, like I said, we're all fighting the good fight. We just kind of need support from each other to lift each other up because we can't do it on our own. Everybody knows that allies are our biggest, our, our biggest help whenever we're trying to make any kind of change. And I think our community just needs more allies. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Um, So as for the narrative, I think that if you look in the past, there was one narrative, really, uh, on the national media stage. You know, you look two years ago and you see an LGBT person on television playing a role, and it's one type of person. It's a white, more feminine gay guy. Mm -hmm. I think that has changed in the last couple of years. I think there's a lot more exposure, which I think is good. It's helping us write our own narrative a little bit more. Um, But I also think that the LGBT community has really while it's still very divisive, I do think that we have come together in ways that, hey, we just need to fundraise and we need to lobby 
politicians to enact change. So I think that is a way of writing our own narrative, you know? Um, the Chamber of Commerce here in Dallas, they send representatives down to like Austin for the Texas Congress like a few times a year, which I had no clue. And I think that is really important in writing your own narrative long term. So I don't know. I think obviously we need to bond together, you know, like it's the same boat. We're all in the same boat, you know? Um, a lot of the rest of the straight world, it seems like, doesn't rec like they don't differentiate really. It's like if you're gay, then you're part of that group. If you're trans, you're part of that group. Like you're all the same mishmash of people, which is true. We are all underneath that umbrella, but I do think there's a lot of um, maybe non inclusiveness within the community. So that could help in a, in a big way. And I think this, you know, I think our social political climate has a lot to do with that too. I think we're now seeing. Um, in in our community where politics and identity and this where this solidarity really ends um, you know I there was something in the news recently where there was like you know a gay he was like the LGBT he went to the Trump rally and he had the LGBT shirt that said lesbian and gays love Trump or something he used the acronym and I think that what I'm seeing now as a you know queer woman of color is is that divisiveness between in a political stance of, of the white LGBT community and the communities of color. I think we're seeing class a little bit more. I think we're seeing race a little bit more within our community. Um, whereas most people believe that we were we are a community like this and erasing like everything else. And I think with the social political climate, the narrative has stopped us to go, okay, so you're my ally, but you voted for Trump. We're together, but how, like, it's starting to, to um, not disintegrate, but it's really starting to uh, fragmentize our community in a sense of okay, so where where are you in 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 this narrative of solidarity? Are you fully with us? Are you halfway? Like, what is it? I think it really does break up the myth of the LGBT community being like one single force. And, you know, when you get millions of people under one umbrella, like, yeah, there are going to be people who vote conservative. Yeah. And that's okay. Like, it shouldn't be this is your whole identity. You know, you have to be with us. Do I think that that's always the best choice, voting, you know, for the conservative party? Absolutely not. Like, we still have a lot of rights to win for everybody in our group. And for me personally, I think it's about saying like, hey, even if I, you know, am fiscally, fiscally conservative, human rights come first. And I'm educating people like that. But I think you're you're really hitting something on the on the head there in the sense that like, hey, how can we be a part of this group that's supposed to be so tight knit and you be so different and worried about other things? Because you are right. There is a lot, I feel like, especially, I don't know, in the last year or two, I've seen a lot of economic differences and you know like hey if you attend this event that's great but you didn't get to go so like it's in group out group on wealth which is a huge issue because i think right now what you're seeing within the community is an issue of race and class yeah. and um you know i think especially because everyone is from the region or lives in the region right now, the Dallas-Fort Worth region, a big thing that's been on an international level is how our um, transgender community of color has been violently attacked. Yeah. And sort of the response that the community here has sort of um, taken in that. Um, I think with progress, what you have is that, or the, the, the caveat of progress is that some people are able to walk through a door first, but then other people are left behind. And when you're able to get through that door, it's like you're kind of like, wait, I forgot that there's other people that are, you know, still suffering. You, we look at the fact that you know, there are people within low income neighbors that don't have access to medicine, that they may not have, they may not be able to, um, they're still dealing with the ignorance on a very, um, uh, I would say, um, more, more difficult and aggressive level than say that the other areas that you may live in. Um, so that being said, what do you guys think just from your own experiences that can be accomplished 
right now, we don't have to say all the entire world, but even say locally, that can be sort of like a um, needle that can be pushed towards trying to improve, I guess you could say, the, the culture as a whole right now. Because what we're dealing with right now, especially with how we're seeing with the internet and information and the political climate and just even the economy and everybody's incomes is that we are seeing that we are s more significantly being divided by your income and even more significantly being divided by your race too as well. Because I think everybody can say here and be, get experiences where they said, oh, well, if you were this, I may date you. Or if you were this, we could be friends. Well, I've never really had a friend of this group that was of this subgroup or X, Y, and Z. And like you said, um, gay men tend to be a lot more vicious along with butch lesbians. So why, is it that, um, what can we do? More specifically, I feel like I'm talking a lot and I apologize, but what can we do to begin to push the needle towards trying to, I guess you could say, fix? Because I don't think that anyone from the outside, the allies or even the people that can fix what's happening in your own house. I think it takes the people within their own family to begin the process of trying to fix a lot of the issues that are going on. So anybody want to take that? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take this. So one thing that I would say uh, is, is very important is to go ahead and get the uh, administrators at local schools backing LGBT progression. I mean, you would be surprised. I'm sure you see it in the media as well. I mean, these kids, some kids are coming out as transgender at a young age, you know, and, and their parents are finding it acceptable, but then their school's administration is not. You know, and so forcing that child back into, you know, back into the bathrooms they don't want to go into, force them to dress a certain way, having these very gender specific um, guidelines for clothing. And, you know, it starts at the schools. It starts at your home and it starts at the schools because these you're learning at a young age what's OK and what's not OK. And if we continuously push people to tell them it's not OK to feel this way, it's not OK to look that way then we're just creating more problems as they grow older. You know, like they always say, hate is a learned trait, and they're starting to learn that young. So I think that's a first step. Okay. I think it's really important to realize that people feel comfortable and safe surrounded by people who are similar to them. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's really important to realize that that can become a problem. You can really create a group of people who look and act and make as just as much money as you, and you just do the same things because everybody has the same passions and hobbies and things like that. I think it's important for people to get involved. I think it's important for obviously people to vote and everything like that. But you know, it can be as simple as if your passion, you know, like being a gay man, is going out to the strip every weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. That's great. But maybe you should be reaching out to the managers of these bars and saying like, hey, we need, like, can we have a, you know, like a Latin night at Roundup on Thursday, once a month? You know, I know that I went to, you know, an indigenous people's festival this weekend and I had a blast. It was amazing. It was so cool. But I would have never found it unless someone I knew was already interested in that. And I know that a lot of nonprofits have a huge issue in attracting a diverse crowd because they're like, you know, why don't they come to our events? Why don't they do anything like that? I'm like, guys, when's the last time we went to Latino Pride? Yeah. When's the last time we went to Southern Pride? Southern Pride? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I think it, something that's huge is just meeting people where they are, saying like, hey, they have these organizations, and if we want to get together and help everybody out and, you know, be a big family underneath this umbrella, um, we've got to be involved in what they like to do as well. So Absolutely. I love that. Meet people where they are, because I think that if we're going to move forward, it needs to be both and. So you need change at, uh, you know, the high administrative political, you need the HRCs, you need those organizations, but you also need the grassroots, you need the people to take to the streets, you need people like you engage to put things like this, you know, to create these community forums. I mean, it starts with the personal, I really believe the personal is political, and you need that balance of both and. You need people to take to the streets, you need the radical is, is just as much as you need the people people that are going to assimilate and try to work from within. And so I think that our, I think our biggest step, the first big step is, is trying to figure out how 
can we move forward together in solidarity without erasing what makes us different and what makes us proud? Awesome. So now we're going to take questions from the audience. If anybody would like to answer or ask, sorry, answer, ask any questions, uh, Gage will be walking around with the microphone. Does anybody have any questions? If not, we can continue going on. Anyone? No? No QA? Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? Yes. Hang on. So I was just curious, what's, um, I know you are talking about the myths that you wish people like to debunk, but what's something that you would want everyone to know about, about you in particular, about the, the community you're representing yourselves? Mm. And that's my question. That's, no, that's a good so, one. That's a good one. Um, okay, I'll start. So we're just, we're there in your everyday life. And you sometimes, in my community specifically, sometimes you don't even know that we're standing right next to you, we're at your church, we're at your dinner table, we're at your place of work, um, and we're, we're good people. You know, we're, we have fought, fought really hard to identify as the gender we're going with and to be that person, and all we, all we ever wanted was just acceptance. You know, we just want to live a normal life like everybody else, and we're facing a lot of adversities because of it. And it, it shouldn't be that way. I, I think for me, I think for lesbians, I think um, perhaps, you know, that we, we aren't all man-hating feminists, you know, that we hate gay men or that, you know, equating lesbianism with that kind of turf feminism, you know, trans-exclusive feminism. Um, that, you know, what I love about being uh, a lesbian, I sexually identify as a lesbian, but I identify as queer, um, is that I get to be like all of these amazing things. And I think that what I love about, you know, now the, the younger millennial, you know, lesbian youth is that they're so much more diverse, you know, and they're coming into themselves and, and realizing that they can, you know, be a lesbian and, and be non-binary. Like there's, it's just so amazing that, that we're finding all of this complexity in this, in this letter and, and we're kind of cross pollinating, uh, you know, with, with everything, you know, I always tell people, you know, I identify more as a gay man than I do as a lesbian woman. You know, I wanted to be a drag queen, you know? And so I think that's what I love is, is seeing how like the youth is bringing that in more into mainstream society, this idea of blurring lines and crossing genders and crossing everything, you know? Yeah, I, mean, I think for what, from what I, my personal experience with the gay community, I think um, how well we organize is something that I'm proud of. I know that a lot of people have issues with like, oh, it's just an expensive party and, you know, that's all they do <laughs> it's for charity events and stuff. But you also have to realize there's, there's a board behind that. There's an, an, an army of volunteers who are doing all of that work for free so you can raise $100,000 to provide 3,000 or 3,000 people with, you know, prep medication for a year with doctors visits and labs included, you know, mm -hmm. it is just like a fun party for a lot of people. Um, but it actually affects a lot of lives and it does a lot of good in the community. And I think that it's needed, whether that's your, your scene or your thing or not. I think that you need those organizations and obviously every subgroup has those and, and does an excellent job. But I think that sometimes, um, we lose focus of what those events are really for, and we just like to criticize. So that's something that, you know, I'm proud of that we're raising all this money and how well we can organize, but at the same time, we, we need to be cognizant of, you know, maybe the public appearance of it. But yeah. Yeah, there's something else I want, I want to add as well to that question is this concept of like transitioning overnight, like, oh, well, you know, I'll just say I'm a girl and go into the woman's restroom. Like, that's not. That's not really how it works, right? I mean, internally, you can come to terms with your gender identity, um, but there is a world, a wor the W Path, um, which is like an organization that sets these standards for transgender health. Um, so if you're looking to medically transition, you have to go see a therapist for X amount of time. You to get a letter to even go to the doctor to even start hormones. 
And then you have to get a letter from them and your therapist to even consider surgery. And they have all of these processes and these steps that you have to take before you're like, okay, like I'm medically trans, I'm going to medically transition. Obviously I've really thought about this and, um, you know, I'm not just going to turn around one day and be like, okay, well, never mind. This was a bad idea. Like that, that's not, that's not how it happens. So uh, I was able to watch the Dave Chappelle skit, and I also didn't know how to react, like you were mentioning, because uh, following Dave Chappelle when I was younger, you know, I knew him as the comedian, and then as you grow up, you see, you know, the different facets of that person, and uh, yeah, I, I thought the joke initially, you know, was bad that he said it was the alphabet people, but then when he continued to go on and describing it as, you know, the LGBTQ in a clown car, mm -hmm. and then the the T person being left out. There was some truth that rang with me because I was like, you know, he wasn't completely wrong there. He, he does have LGBTQ friends and that's what they did mention to him was an inner conflict within the community. So f for y'all, is there any other inner conflicts within the community that should be brought to light? I mean, I think, I think it's important to realize that everybody up on this stage, everybody in this community is a human being and we're not all going to agree on everything and people have bad qualities nobody is a hundred percent good um, but i think it's about once again meeting people where they are and finding those common grounds because i hear it all the time i'll be you know like a roundup or something and you'll see a, a, a pack of women running through having a great time and then you just hear comment after comment after comment like oh god they have their own bars like why are they here why are they here why are they here when in reality, it should be like, the more the merrier. Yes, women, bring your friends, whether you're straight or, or gay or lesbian, I mean, I mean lesbian, um, or bisexual, um, or transgender, all of them. Um, <laughs> but, but it should be like, absolutely bring everyone you can into this community so more people can be exposed to this. And, you know, like the econ economic value of people visiting our neighborhood it is important. And if it got flooded with straight people every weekend, there'd be more gay bars, there'd be more diversity, there'd be more inclusiveness. We'd be rubbing shoulders with people we never run into in our normal lives. So yeah, there are some walls, but I think it's just important to realize like it's such a diverse group that there is always going to be some friction, but you just have to say, I'm not for identity politics. And so if we don't agree on everything, it doesn't mean we can't agree on the majority of things. And people have different passion pro projects, you know? Some people love, like, calling the city and saying, there should be a four-way stop at the end of my street, you know? And if someone on the other street could say, I don't want to stop every day at this stupid four-way intersection, are you going to hate someone for that, you know? When you both say, like, you know, go Elizabeth Warren, let's erase student debt, are you going to hate that person? And I think that's really what it has come down to is we're just looking for something different in another person, another human being, so that we can say, well, you're not like me. You're not my group. We don't agree. We're done. And I think when that just becomes the mainstream, it's pretty toxic. And I think, um, like, you you know, the in the special, they talk about leaving the tea behind. I think we've also, as a community, left other members of our letter out, you know, out of it. I mean, the Roundup didn't get their first female, you know, bartender until 2017. I did an article. They had no women working there. Their first person of color uh, started working there, I think, uh, maybe at the beginning of that year. It was all white. So I, I think I think we need to I think we need to bring those issues to light. Um, I know my wife um, is the manager at JR's Bar and Grill. She's the first female manager ever, not to mention she's a black woman. So they have never had a female manager over at JR's Bar and Grill. And now she's the first black, she's worked there for 22 years. Like she's been there forever. And so I think that, you know, I, I, I was with you. Like I saw that, you know, Yes, we we leave the T behind, but we've also left the B, we've left the L, we left the G, we left the the black L, you know, the intersex L. Like we've we've left all bits and pieces behind at some point, and I think that we as a community need to acknowledge that we haven't done a good enough job being as inclusive as people think we are. Um, my question has to do with uh, allyship. Um, 
with the transgender people and obviously we all have heard about the the younger uh case and all the misinformation and a lot of the talking points that are being spread have been by a federalist article by walt Hare, who previously lived as a transgender woman but since has de-transitioned um, as members that are not transgender in the community, um, where do you see yourself as being actually an ally to our trans siblings and f combating all that misinformation that's coming within from a former member of the community, but it's being spread around by other members of our own community? So I just want to like clarify, yeah, what's clarify too. Oh, okay, so he's talking about a story. Um, I think it was a divorce. Two parents were going through a divorce, and the dad didn't want the daughter to transition. Um, male to female, daughter, and she's seven years old. And during the case, uh, they came basically like I think there was there were some Texas politicians that spoke out against this case and granted them joint custody again when they that's not what they were wanting originally because the father has been toxic to the child mm -hmm. and uh but since the daughter was transitioning um they found that it was illegitimate um for the the mother to take the child full custody so they want joint custody um and i do want to say on this detransition um topic that that's less than the 1% of the transgender community actually comes back and says, I don't want to transition anymore. Um, and unfortunately, those kinds of stories about someone who is detransitioning, those are the ones that are spread the most. Like, oh, these people are just confused. They don't know what they're doing. They're damaging their lives, you know. But I just want to say on, on that note, I was listening to something the other day when they were talking about someone who's wanting to transition and then you can have a peer it's like that's a bad idea you shouldn't do it and then while they do transition all you're doing to that person is saying oh you're a freak you have you're mentally ill all these negative connotations and then you force them to go back to detransition you're like see i told you you would never want that well you attacked me the whole time and to make make me feel like i shouldn't do this because i'm so fragile you know and um but just I just wanted to say to say that piece, but on on the case of the girl, I mean, you don't the at a child that age, they're not medically transitioning. They they don't even have hormones at seven, you know, like enough to like go through puberty or anything. And so, when they're transitioning as a child, is basically just you're changing your clothes and your name and your pronoun. There's and the child still has the option to do whatever they please. Um, so it's not it's not like they're forcing hormones down the child's throat. So I do have a question pertaining to that. I have heard that the sooner you transition, the smoother the process in the sense yes. of like before puberty really hits. That's true. So I think that probably would affect the court case, right? Mm -hmm. Since there's some science to back that, or is that just still in its infancy? Science, science to back what? That they... The, the earlier you transition, the better. Right, because basically you're not, you don't have all of your natal you know hormones going through uh to to back change all of that progress basically to go on with your new your new hormones okay. um yeah so it is it is better so it is harder for especially like older uh people who are transitioning to start transitioning because the effects um are less harsh and I think I wanted to, I think your question also had to do something with like allyship and how, how to support. And I think that for those of us who are in, I mean, obviously we are all here. We are all privileged. I mean, we are, a, we are privileged to be here. We all sit in our own kind of ranking of privilege. But I think that whatever power and privilege that we do hold, I think it's our job as a community and to be allies to each other, to amplify each other's voices. So for instance, you know, I know for a fact that trans, you know, black trans women, their voices are low on the totem pole. I also know that two-spirited native people's voices are also low on the total 
totem pole. So my job as somebody who has access to media, that has access to the Dallas Voice and can write for these places, my job and my responsibility as an ally to myself and my gente is to help amplify those voices, is to bring into, you know, bring those people into the Dallas Voice, to, you know, interview them, you know, to show that, you know, bring them into a space where they are recognized for what they're doing and using my platform to lift them up. So that is how I feel I am a good ally or I, I hope that I'm a good ally to my community because I help amplify the voices of the most quiet. Well, we'd like to thank our panelists for joining us this evening. I'd like to also say, yeah, this was awesome. Wasn't it awesome? So we're only, we're, cut for time, but um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Um, again, we'd like to apologize for our fourth panelist that wasn't able to make it due to an emergency, but when we first started off this idea of Humanity 101, we really wanted to create an environment to where the community could discuss and have dialogue. And we could talk about things that we sometimes talk about with our individual friends or groups either Monday through Friday or right before we go out to bars or clubs and become social, um, more in an environment that is um, constructive. We are now in a, in, a, um, in a space now where a lot of people are going into echo chambers. We are now in a space of where people are um, going in, filing into their own individual tribalism. And now more than ever, it is important for everyone to um, figure out new venues, unconventional venues for us to get together. Um, and I say that across all platforms. There was a time that when uh, there was a crisis, and, and, and I think when we're talking, well, there is a crisis now, but when we're talking about before this whole internet stage came up, the, it was a family dynamic, a very strong family dynamic. You know, the elders were very present. We respected our elders. It's not really like that anymore. We're not really looking out for the youth, and I feel like with any group, the biggest thing is that you have to have education, People must feel inspired. And we also have to self-sustain ourselves. You cannot continue to rely on allies or other people to come in and save the day. We have to lead the charge. We cannot expect for them to be driving the car. We have to drive our own car. And I mean that across all platforms. So next year, me and Gage are coming back. We plan on trying to figure out new ways that we can make this uh, bigger, better, more inclusive. We would like for everyone to continue to spread the word, please, about this. This is definitely something that I feel like right now is needed. Um, we are open to more ideas if it is focused on one group. We don't want it to feel like this is just one particular um, platform for one type of area. We want it. We want everyone to feel like they are in equally involved and invested in this. This is a grassroots type thing. So. Um, Again, we'd like to thank our panelists. We'd like to thank everyone that has been coming out. Gage, you have worked like a rock star this past uh, year. Yeah, we've yeah, we pretty much have been kicking ass. So hopefully we'll see you guys next year. And thank you guys so much for coming to Humanity 101 Alphabet Education. Thank, thank you, you for thank the you. space. Yeah, thanks, yes, thank you, thank you for good. creating the space. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Thomas, and thank you, panel, um, for an awesome evening. Uh, so we have two winners for tonight's um, $15 Starbucks gift cards. Our first winner is Catherine Livingston. I think that's you in the back. Awesome. And Jose Jimenez. So if you guys will just meet me at the back um, afterwards, I will get you guys the card. So, again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, panelists. Um, be safe out there and look forward to seeing you all at our um, events next year. So keep us we'll keep you posted have a good one